Okay, good afternoon everybody. This will be a 30 minute lesson on intervals and this lesson is geared at upper elementary and middle school. So let's review what we've done so far. We have learned how to construct our own grand staff, placing all of the notes of the musical alphabet in their correct spots relative to middle C. We remember the guide notes A, C, E, and the thing that helps us remember those is the flying ace goes down, A, C, E. Middle C gives us the reference point for the rest of the, of the grand staff, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. We remember in the treble clef, the mnemonic device, every good boy does fine, and F, A, C, E. If a note is on a line, it rhymes with fine, and is therefore every good boy does fine. If a note is in a space, it rhymes with face, and is F-A-C-E. And when you move down to the bass clef, the mnemonic devices are good boys do fine always, and all cows eat grass. And of course, you remember the lowest line on the bass clef is Grandpa G. Well, you, you can't be fluent in music if you can't discuss the distance between each of these pitches, and that's what intervals are. An interval is the distance between two pitches. And as an example, I'll play some intervals for you on the xylophone, the marimba, the orf instrument. Here is an interval called a major second. Its nickname is the chopstick interval. That's the chopstick interval. Here's a major third. Now compared to the major second, the major third has a happier, a happier, brighter sound. Major second, major third. Maybe it's easier to hear on the piano. Let's try it here. Here's the major second. And here's the major third. Now right now these intervals don't mean anything to you, but they will very shortly. Now here's an interval that's called a perfect fourth. Its nickname is, here comes the bride. Ah, I think Hopper's probably laughing at that one. Okay, here's an interval called a perfect fifth. This interval's called a major sixth. happy and bright. It sounds rather wide too, doesn't it? Because there's a pretty big distance between these two pitches. So this interval sounds kind of wide. Now here's a discordant, a discordant interval called a major seventh. And the characteristic of the major seventh is that it really badly wants to resolve into an octave. Right? Okay. Well anyway, I don't expect you to remember that, I just wanted you to experience what the different intervals themselves sound like. Now, a couple of years ago for most of you, I taught you the interval song both as a uh, technique exercise on the marimba and as something just to remember to help you navigate your way through intervals. And let me review that to you right now. It goes like this. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, octave. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh, octave. Let me do it again for you. I'll go slow motion this time. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, octave. I'll teach you how to play it on your piano because I know that about one-third of you have pianos in your home and so you'll be able to do that on your piano in just a couple minutes. Well, let's talk about the nomenclature. Nomenclature means naming system. Let's talk about the nomenclature. You know what? That's a great word. I'm going to write that word down for you. Nomenclature. Nomenclature equals or you remember the sign is defined as is defined as 
naming system. Now, we often use the word nomenclature when we're talking about science and, and um, taxonomy. In other words, the science of dividing things into phylum and uh, genus, species, all those things. That's nomenclature, but there's also nomenclature in mathematics and other branches of science. But there's nomenclature in music, too. The nomenclature of intervals is very specific to the individual interval. And let me show you what I mean. You use the words major, minor, perfect, augmented, and diminished, all to describe intervals. But only some of that nomenclature applies to some intervals. For example, in the ascending scale, you hear the word major and you hear the word perfect. In the descending scale, you hear the word minor and the word perfect. So listen one more time to my, my, my interval song. Major, second, major, third, perfect, fourth, perfect, fifth, major, sixth, major, seventh, octave. That was the ascending scale. The descending scale uses the nomenclature minor and perfect. Minor, second, minor, third, perfect, fourth, perfect, fifth, minor, sixth, minor, seventh, octave. Now, you may say, why, why are they major on the way up and why are they minor on the way down? It has everything to do with the pattern of whole steps and half steps in the major scale. Do you remember what those are from the last lesson? Step, step, half step. Step, 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 half step. Let me say that again. Step, step, half step. Step, 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 half step. And because of that half step at the top and the whole step at the beginning, everything is different on the way down. I don't know if that's the best way to just to explain that. You have a major interval at the beginning and a minor interval at the top. And because the major interval starts things out, everything stays major or perfect. And because the minor interval starts it out on the way down, everything goes minor. Does that make any sense? Okay, anyway, you won't have to worry about that unless you major in music and start to really look into it in college. Let's do our interval song four times in a row and see if we can remember it. So go ahead and sing with me as soon as you can. Go ahead and try it right away. We'll start out slow and we'll get faster. And once we've got the interval song ma uh, mastered, then I'll give you some of the theory behind it. So remember, it's major intervals on the way up, minor intervals on the way down. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh octave. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Would you believe I, I made this up several years ago, maybe even ten, ten or more years ago, as a tool to, uh, to teach the kindergarten and preschool? And it just works so well to teach them. So I've, I've just brought it up through all the levels because it, it really, really does work to remember it. And then when you hear a song and you're trying to figure it out on the piano like Anne Elaine will do, or a lot of you will try to do, um, you can use that interval song to figure out what the intervals are. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major six, major seven. Try to sing it with me. So major on the way up, four and five are perfect, and the other numbers are major. On the way down, four and five are still perfect, and the other numbers are minor. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, octave. Going down, minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, Minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Now, to help you sing it, what do you say we do this? 
major second, ah, this may help. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh octave. Let's go down. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Do it one more time with me. Are you ready? Here we go. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh octave. Rest, rest. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Okay, now I'll show you how to do that on the keyboard. There's a couple steps you have to go through. I tell you what, I better bring this over because I'm not sure you can see it. Maybe you can, but let's do it anyway. This has a little boing, 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 boing to it, doesn't it? All right, there it is. All right, so now I'll turn this up. You didn't get to see it, but in one of the earlier videos, this whole thing fell apart, fell down and crashed and all that. It could still do it, so I'll try to be very careful. All right, so hopefully you can see this and it's in the frame of the video. On your piano, the first thing you do is you identify D in the doghouse. Here's the doghouse. The doghouse is the two black notes. Not the three black notes, but the two black notes. Inside the doghouse is the dog. Inside the doghouse is the dog. Inside the doghouse is the dog. Let's just pick this doghouse. I'm gonna put my right hand index finger on the dog. And I'm going to put my left hand index finger on the note to the left. This one is on C or cat. This one's on dog. Okay, so let's do that again. Find your two black notes. Here's your D in the doghouse. Right hand. Left hand. Okay, left hand is on C, right hand's on D. I'm not going to move my C. It's going to stay right there. My right hand is going to move up. Okay. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major six, major seven, octave. All right, so let's do it again. Let's find our D. Find the two black notes. It could be this one. It could be this one. I'm just using my fingers like braille, really. Finding the two black notes. Here's the two black notes. Here's the two black notes. Let's use these two black notes. There's my D. Here's my C. Okay. My C doesn't move. My right hand doesn't move. I mean, my left hand doesn't move. Only my right hand moves. My right hand's moving up. My left hand is staying put. Major second, major third, perfect fourth. Right hand stays put, left hand goes up right next door. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Let's do it again. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh octave. Rest, rest. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Let's go again. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major six, major seven, octave, move up. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor six, minor seven, octave, let's go again. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major six, major seven, octave, rest, rest. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor six, minor seven, octave, okay. So that's how you do that song on your piano. I would like you to memorize that song because it's so important. It's so important to understanding and knowing your intervals. Now let's talk a little bit about intervallic theory. All right, in essence, here it is. Long, long, long time ago, ancient Greeks, ancient Romans. Did the Greeks and Romans live on the earth at the same time? Yes. About what time was that? 
just about <coughs> this year, <laughs> zero, <laughs> 0 BC up to about 600 BC. Now, there's still a thing called a Holy Roman Empire well into the 18th century. It's still kind of the Romans, but not really. When I'm talking about the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, I mean the year zero to the year 600 AD. So that's the era of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. We call that period in music, music of the ancients, right? That makes a lot of sense, the music of the ancients. Well, there was a luminous figure in that period by the name Boethius. He was a Roman mathematician and religious figure, as well as a scientist. And the thing that uh, makes him unique for his day is he was universally educated. Now that means Boethius read every single book written in his day. That was a much easier task back then. I happen to know the last universally educated person was Milton. If you, if you remember who Milton is, Milton is an English poet. Very important, modern era, but that doesn't mean 20th century. But nonetheless, he's a modern era English poet who is said to be the last universally educated person on earth. After Milton, um, educational writing, all writing in general, exploded because the, the, uh, the processes of printing and the processes of dispersing books throughout the world became easier and it became impossible to be universally educated after Milton. All right, back to Boethius. So Boethius is a Roman mathematician. He's also an astronomer. He's an astronomer and he's deeply interested in planets and their courses. When you say courses, you mean the orbits that the planets travel in. Boethius, because of his knowledge of music and mathematics, discerned that planets, by their mere size and their speed and their orbits themselves, created music. And he called this the music of the spheres. Music of the spheres. Would you believe that in the 20th century it was proven that there is such a thing as music of the spheres and that the moon and all of the other planets in our solar system actually create a inaudible frequency by their speed, their size, and their overall mass spinning through their orbits that equates to musical sounds. So Boethius, nearly uh, 1,200 years later, or I guess it's closer to 1400 years later, was proven correct that indeed the planets themselves do make sounds, the very sounds that he called uh, the music of the spheres. Boethius is important to our interval study because Boethius invented the scale. And when I say invented, he really did. He created the musical scale by taking a reed, taking an open pipe-like piece of plant material called a reed. You can think of it like a piece of bamboo. And he, he worked on it a little bit, cleaned it up, made it very, very even, made sure it was hollowed out very nicely. And he discovered you could blow through the reed and make sounds. Well, that wasn't new. That wasn't new because people had already invented some forms of musical instruments using things like that. However, Boethius discovered that you could take that reed and if you cut it an exact length, Every time, if you cut it the same length every time, in other words, multiple pieces of bamboo cut at eight foot uh, lengths, they produced a certain note. We know that now as A440, A440. Well, that same eight foot reed could be cut in half again, and that pitch would then become the pitch one octave up. So here's an eight foot pitch, here's a four foot pitch, and here, you probably guessed, is a two foot pitch, right? Every subsequent time you cut that reed in half, it produces the octave up. Well, what happens if you don't go 
to the half? What if you cut two-thirds of the way up, or if you cut one-quarter of the way up, or if you cut... What if you cut in equal intervals all the way up? Well, equal intervals gave Boethius this sound. The whole tone scale. So Boethius had that sound. You know what? It's so funny because isn't that kind of Star Trek-y in a way? That's the whole tone scale. Well, Boethius worked and worked and worked, and he figured out that if you cut some of the some of the lengths of pipe mathematical fractions, like one fifth or two thirds or three fifths, you're going to get specific pitches. And guess what they are? The perfect fourth and the perfect fifth. So now Boethius has these pitches. Okay. Anyway. That's probably enough. That's all you need to know about Boethius, um, the Roman mathematician and astronomer who was so important to the development of scale. By, by furthering his work, all of the pitches of the scale eventually came to light, and that's how we got our eight-pitch scale as we know it. Well, the distance between two pitches was the next thing that Boethius decided to define. And that's what our intervals are. Intervals are the distance between two pitches. And just so you know, intervals have the following characteristics. Ascending or descending. They can be an ascending perfect fourth or a descending perfect fourth. They can be prime. They can be major, minor, augmented, or diminished. So those are the characteristics of intervals. Now, let me show you a concrete example of how to picture intervals. So in our interval song, remember we play the C and then we play the D. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, octave. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave. Using my orange marker, I'm going to write that in for you right now. Would you take your piece of paper and your pencil and would you write C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, just like I did in this, this uh, ziggurat looking thing, this pyramid looking and then go backwards, C, B, G, F. Just, just copy that exactly the way you see it. I'll give you a second to do that. While you do that, I'm going to check something else. Okay. Okay. After you've done your letters, would you add your stair step? If you need to, pause the video right now so you can get that done. And here's the next step. Between C to D is a major second. Between, and major is always a capital M. Between C and E is a major third. Between C and F is a perfect fourth. Between C and G is a perfect fifth. Between C and A is a major sixth. Between C and B is a major seventh. Let's do an inter international seven. How about that? International seven. And then between C and C is a perfect octave. Okay? Remember, all of these intervals are relative to the starting note. And when you count the interval, you must count the starting note. Let me say that again to you. All of these intervals are relative to the starting note. Watch the edge of the xylophone. Watch right here. Okay? 
From here to here is one, two. That's my second, my major second. From here to here, one, two, three. There's our third. One, two, three, four. Here's our fourth. One, two, three, four, five. Here's our fifth. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's our sixth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's our major seventh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's our major, but we call it perfect. This is our perfect octave. And there's one interval I haven't told you about yet. It's called a perfect prime, and it's an interval of zero. It's an interval of zero. So that's, here's our perfect prime. No distance. No distance between C and itself, right? Perfect prime. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, octave. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh, octave. Okay? Will you sing that song with me again one more time? Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, octave. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh, finish our downward scale. As I said before, on the downward scale, we have to use minor intervals, and that's because at the top you have a half step. So there's a half step between C and B, and I'll prove it to you right now. C and B are right next to each other without an intervening black note. There's no black note here. So that gives us a half step instead of a whole step. Here between C and D, that's a whole step because it has a black note in between. So that's a whole step. This is a half step. Because of that half step, it literally makes everything below it a minor interval because of that half step. Okay? So minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh octave and let's fill those in minor second I gotta come over here sorry minor second minor you know what I made a mistake let's get rid of that minor is indicated with a little m little m minor second minor third Perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor international seven, perfect octave. And let's go ahead and put perfect prime over here. P zero, perfect prime, P zero, perfect octave, P eight. Okay. So now our graphic has a whole lot of really good information on it, right? It has the scale notes as they go up. It has the indicated interval between the two. And remember, the interval is always relative to the first note. So here's the first note. Major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh octave. Minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh, octave. If you lose track of the first note, you'll lose track of your interval. So for instance, just going from here to here, I know that's a major third, but it might not be. So it always starts. So understand that these things are relative to the first note of the scale. They're relative to the first note of the scale. It turns out that any scale will work, but you have to start with the first note of the scale for this pattern, for this pattern to work. Okay, let's see, what else do I want to teach you? I know what I want to teach you. The final thing we'll do before we close out this lesson is some ear training, some ear training. So I'm going to play an interval for you and I want you to answer same or different. Now this is the simplest way to start. 
All you have to do is tell me if you're hearing the same note or a different note. Same or different. If you can see my hands, please don't watch them. Are you ready? Here's your first pitch. Second pitch. Are they the same or different? Okay, don't watch my hands if you can avoid it. They were different. What about this? Same or different? Listen again. Okay. Now, I think you probably got both of those right. If you didn't get both of those right, don't despair. We just have to work a little bit harder on that. Um, for some people, it's difficult to hear pitches right off the bat. In fact, studies have shown that about 1% of people, about 1% of people in the world can't hear, can't discern the difference between intervals. Their hearing is just not that acute. Same or different? Let me give you those again. Okay. Now, in this next exercise, I want you to tell me whether you hear one pitch or two pitches at the same time. Okay. I want you to tell me whether you hear one pitch or two pitches at the same time. Are you ready? Here's your first example. Just say one or two. Are you ready? Here we go. Okay. The first time you heard right, and then the second time you heard Okay, that was easy. What about this? Is this one pitch or two? Okay, listen again. What is it? Okay, it's two pitches. Good, I'm proud of you. What about right here? Is that two pitches or one pitch? If you're very advanced, you heard two pitches, and you might have also known that it was a major third. Major second, major third. Okay? That's pretty advanced. Pretty advanced. I can remember my college ear training course, one of my best friends at the time, and we worked, we had a summer job together of uh, repairing school lockers. And you, you do crazy summer jobs when you're in college, uh, some of the time, especially if you need money. And my summer job was repairing lockers. So uh, we would go into often unair un conditioned high schools and with a whole booklet of like all 2,000 locker combinations and we'd have to check all the lockers. But anyway, my, my buddy and I developed a good friendship with him. We were both in music school. And uh, he had a lot of difficulty with ear training. He was a very fine musician, but he just had great difficulty hearing intervals and and being able to play by ear. It was definitely not his gift. So if you're having trouble listening to these intervals and identifying what they are, uh, don't despair. It can be learned. We just have to spend a little bit more time doing it. Okay, so that's the end of this lesson right now. We learned about intervals. We learned about Boethius, the Roman mathematician who invented, if you will, the, the scale and identified prime and perfect intervals from that uh, from that study of cutting the reed down um, multiple times to get different lengths and blowing air through it. We learned about the uh, structure of the major scale and its intervals, major second, major third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, and octave. We learned that intervals are always relative to a starting pitch and that when you're counting the intervals, you start with the note you begin on to count it one two, three, four. There's a fourth. One, two, three, four, five. And if you make the mistake of only counting the notes in between, you've named the interval wrong. Like, watch. There's three notes in between, but that's irrelevant. You have to count the one you're on and the one you're going to. One, two, three, four, five. I tell you what, let's go 60 more seconds. Look at my keyboard and tell me what interval I'm playing. Boy, I hope you can see this. I'll be embarrassed if you can't. So, what is this interval? 
Did you say second or major second? That's great if you did. If you said second or major second, they're both correct. One, two, so it's a second. What about this one? It's a third. What about this one? One, two, three, four, five. It's a sixth. What about this one? One, two, three, four. It's a fifth. Okay, let's wrap up our lesson right now. Boys and girls, I hope you're doing well. I'm sorry we can't be together. One day soon, we will be able to. We'll all come out of hiding. <laughs> I'm kind of fat. I'm getting so fat because I can't do my two daily workouts. Oh, I hate that. That's probably the thing I miss the most. That and being able to get a fresh haircut when you want it. I miss both of those. My stomach is growling now even though I don't need to feed it anymore, but I'm going to. And I'm thinking about going to Piggly Wiggly and getting something bad for me like a pizza. <laughs> anyway, take care boys and girls. I miss you terribly. Bye-bye.